Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Virginia Lee, BioCentury Associate Editor, and I'm joined today by Aaron Koch Tusman, Associate Editor, Simon Fishburn, Editor in Chief, Steve Austin, Washington Editor. Today, Steve will give us an update from Washington after the Trump administration on Friday released a series of rules that could reshape the drug pricing landscape in the U.S. if they can overcome the legal and logistical challenges in place. But first, Karen will give us a preview of data to watch out for at the upcoming American Society of Hematology meeting in early December. Karen, what are you seeing in the abstracts leading up to ASH this year? What's really nice about these big conferences like ASH is it gives us the ability to home in on some hot topic emerging areas that we've been following and get a snapshot of who's doing what and what it looks like. And so my colleague Lauren Martz did a great dive first on the BCMA data that's coming out at ASH. So looking at the CAR T cells and the bispecifics, one of the standouts there was J&J and Legends. CAR T cell against BCMA and multiple myeloma. And in general, we're seeing really good efficacy, good ORRs for this class of therapies going against this target. And one of the sort of steps away from that was from allergene, the allogeneic CAR T cell that they had there, which leads to some questions around, can allogeneic T cells perform as well as autologous CAR T cells? We then did a dive on what's the allogeneic CAR T cell data. This is the modality that, you know, we're of course watching. It offers the opportunity to have off-the-shelf therapies that you don't individually manufacture for each patient, but can they perform as well as autologous? And so looking now across a range of different targets and, and indications, what was the allogeneic data presented? Looks like there's sort of a mixed picture. One of the standouts was this Chinese company called Biohang. It's still in a small number of patients, but showed OR of 83% in BALL. And they're uh, allogeneic CAR T's going after CD19 and CD22, so different indication. But one of the things that we are starting to see in the allogeneic CAR T space is the primary concern there had been, can you make sure that these T cells won't go after the patient's host cells? Could to have graft versus host activity. And in general, from the data we're seeing at ASH from allergene, selectives and biohang and other things we've seen reported, it, it seems like they've gotten around the GVHD question, but we're still actually seeing with these cells, cytokine release syndrome that you see with autologous CAR T's. So Karen, what, the question I have is bottom line, how promising do the allogeneic CAR T cells look like, the CAR T therapies? And are there going to be advantages, the obvious one, in, ter in terms of money? Are they going to be a lot cheaper to produce? And are there going to be some cancers that can be tackled with them that they'll be good enough? Should the efficacy get there, I think the cost advantages will be real. The accessibility advantages will be real. So it's really worth pursuing. As far as will they be good enough, there's a, a couple different variables that are being tested here. One of them is around, how do you make these allogeneic CAR T's? What do you use to edit them? Are you using tail and are you using CRISPR? Are you using shRNA? And then there's also some aspects around, are you editing some other things in addition to just the TCR you're getting rid of to prevent graft versus host? What other tweaks are you making? And so I think at this point, it's too early to say if as a whole, the class is going to be able to perform. We've seen some cases, actually, Allogene had a candidate, some data for, I think it was Allo501, that was a CD19 targeting car, and it did look like it was on equal footing with the marketed autologous CAR T cells when they were at a similar stage of development. But in the case of BCMA, the Allogene CAR T cell was disappointing relative to the others at ASH. I think there's variables including what target and indication and also how are these cells being actually tweaked uh, that we'll have to look out for. Karen, I have another question on top of that. Looking at it, they all seem after sort of a very limited number of targets, BCMA, CD22, CD19. Do you think the field's just going to sort itself out with those targets before people really start going after new ones? Or are you seeing the signs of it getting broader? Well, you always hear about with new modalities, it's like, can we re reduce the target risk first while we sort out the modality and then go after more interesting and exciting targets that touch 
indications that haven't been touched yet. So I think we will continue to see these targets we've seen, CD19, DCMA, CD22, being the proving ground for these allogeneic CAR Ts for a while. And one more question on this front. You know, it's one of those areas that has just, for whatever reason, become incredibly polarized in a non-political sense, but still you're either an allogeneic believer or you're an autologous believer. And I've seen very heated sort of, I'll never go there. Do you think the allogeneic cells have got enough traction now? Are these data promising enough that you think you might sort of see people crossing over and saying, well, actually allogeneics do have some advantages that are, are worth leaving autologous for? We saw Selectus's investors respond positively to their data in the ALL, it was a 40% ORR. Again, these are all small numbers of patients, but I think in general, despite the setback for the allogene data they presented for ALO715 uh, at this conference, I, I think we are seeing enough positive momentum forward that it's not grinding the space to a halt. I think that people will continue pushing in this way and it'll be about figuring out which candidate can really outshine their autologous counterparts. Karen, beyond the allogeneic CAR-T therapies, are there any particular targets in any modality that will see transformative data at ASH? It was a great time to check in on CD47 because this is a target that you know, we've been watching for a while. It has the potential to be a myeloid checkpoint inhibitor in the vein of um, the PD-1, pdl ones It's about what's actually proving out here. So here we got a chance to double dip from ASH and SITSI. One of the interesting things was from ALX Oncology, which is going after using their CD47 inhibitor in solid tumors uh, as well as liquid tumors. It was interesting. They highlighted data from a pretty small number of patients, smaller than what they'd shown before. But what they were saying is they're really homing in there on the combinations of the CD47 plus antibodies against tumor targets plus chemotherapy regimens. That's what they're going to be going forward with in um, their phase two. And they showed some promising data there. Then we got to see some data from Gilead. They acquired 47 a couple months ago for a handsome sum of 4.9 billion. Here, their lead indication is in myelodysplastic syndrome, but here they were showing off their AML data and specifically pointing to how it might be the CD47 inhibitor plus azacitidine might be particularly uh, interesting in the P53 mutant patients. Another interesting one here was the first time we're seeing clinical data from IMAB, a Chinese company. They did a deal with Abvi for their CD47 inhibitor, and it was one of the bigger upfront, I think 180 million upfront that we were seeing for these cross-border deals in China. So they gave the first glimpse of the data there. It was three patients and one response so far, still early, but something that we're watching for. And then on that front, a while back, we were sort of pegging as CD47 going to be the next PD-1. I'm still not sure that we know that yet, but you've seen Gilead and Abvi snap up a couple of deals or in, in Gilead's case, snap up a company. Early on, you did a story on all the new companies that were being created around CD47. So do you expect this data to start triggering a bunch of deal activity? Potentially, I guess from the companies that are presenting data at CIT and ASH that aren't perhaps partnered in the same way, we've got ALX Oncology and Trillium. And in both cases, the data looks, there's a promising signal there. Trillium highlighted how they had some single agent activity from an IgG4, which people have thought you might not be able to do that. So uh, it's possible we might see more deals or takeouts in this space. One last thing on Ash, Karen, your story also mentioned sickle cell disease as a hot topic at the meeting. Can you give us a brief overview of what we should expect to see there? Sure. The sickle cell disease data here, kind of building on what we saw at the EMA meeting a couple months ago, general companies were reporting positive data and so took the opportunity to look at what were the endpoints, what were the markers of positive data that they're showing? Because we are seeing this shift in the sickle cell disease field away from endpoints that are purely defined based on vaso-occlusive crises. So the number of uh, VOCs they're called that that a patient experiences or things around the VOC rate. Also getting at endpoints that get at the 
hemoglobin and the sort of molecular basis of disease, because we're seeing now this next wave therapies are directly hitting at that root cause of disease. We saw some data from uh, these ex vivo gene therapies from Bluebird and Arivent. Bluebird in particular, they've had some data before, but in this case, they're uh, particularly highlighting, it looks like the manufacturing method that they're going to be going forward with, their optimized process there. There, they were able to really show a, a range of both reduction in uh, the VOC rate, in addition to some of these molecular markers, the sickling propensity of red blood cells. The CRISPR therapeutics data stood out as well, I think in particular for the duration, because they are gene editing hematopoietic cells, putting them back in. And in this case, one of the things that was really striking was the fact that I think one patient had no VOC crises for I think over a year. That kind of duration data is really key and it was a big signifier that things look promising. Then we've got some kind of earlier stage data from Agios and Forma, which they're going after it in a different way with small molecules that influence PKR, which they think improves metabolic flux in red blood cells. Here, uh, the data was earlier and they didn't have readouts yet on the effect on vasoocclusive crises, but they did have data around what's going on with the levels of hemoglobin that doesn't sickle and what do the red blood cells look like. We're seeing a lot of momentum in this space after the approvals last year from Novartis and Global Blood. It's definitely something to watch out for to see more and more data getting around the root cause of the disease. All right, I'm going to switch gears now and turn to the latest drug pricing rules out of Washington. Steve, last week, the Trump administration released a final interim most favored nation rule, as well as a rule that would eliminate rebate payments to PBMs and insurance companies for Medicare Part D drugs. So can you start by walking us through those rules and what the implications are for the industry? The most important one is the most favored nation, the MFN rule. The White House waited till 60 days were left on its clock to try to slip this through. It's an enormously consequential change in the way that drugs are reimbursed. And really, before I describe what they did, I have to say that there's a good chance that it, it's just not going to happen. There's probably a German word for something that seems like it isn't a big deal because it doesn't happen, but it didn't happen because people recognized it was a big deal and they prevented it from happening. So but it's not like you... Steve, is it not going to happen because it's not going to happen before the end of this administration? Or is it not going to happen because it's going to get rolled back with the next one? I think it's not going to happen because it's going to be blocked in court. Before um, it even gets there. Be before it even gets there. But again, it's going to be blocked in court because people really care about this because it's really a tremendously important change. So the idea behind the most favored nation idea for drugs is to create an international reference pricing system that would cap reimbursement under Medicare Part B at the lowest price paid by any developed country, any OECD country. Since Part B is primarily biologics, bio and its members see this really as a dagger aimed right at the heart of their companies. If it goes into effect, tens of billions of dollars in revenues for biologics like ILEA, Opdivo, and Keytruda would just evaporate. Again, I think it's not gonna happen in part because the Trump administration waited until the last minute, and then they took a shortcut. They issued something that you mentioned at the beginning, an interim final rule. The courts are very likely to agree with drug companies that most favored nation doesn't qualify for an interim final rule. If they do, then they'll just kick it out and it'll be up to the Biden administration to decide whether it wants to reinstate this. The drug companies are taking this threat very seriously because nothing's 100% certain in litigation. And if this were to go through, it would have enormous implications for all biologics. And then what was the rebate rule that was also issued on Friday? So the rebate rule is something that the biopharmaceutical industry very strongly supports, but again, is likely to be thrown out by the courts also. Basically, what the administration is trying to do is to prevent PBMs and insurers from charging rebates to Medicare Part D drugs in exchange for putting drugs onto formularies or for giving them favorable formulary placement. The drug companies, patient groups, and physician groups all support the idea of getting rid of the, the rebates because they have perverse unintended consequences. One of those perverse unintended consequences is that they jack up the list prices and 
Medicare beneficiaries who have to pay a copay based on a percentage of the list price are hurt by that. Patients who don't have coverage and have to pay the full price are really devastated by it. The problem is that the PBMs and the insurance companies use those rebates in large part to subsidize premiums. So if the rebates are scrapped, premiums are going to go up. The executive order that President Trump signed allowing Alex Azar at HHS to revoke the authority for rebates specified that he could only do that if revoking the rebates wouldn't increase premiums. So what Alex Azar did was he just wrote a letter saying, in my personal opinion, this won't increase rebates. He didn't provide any data to substantiate that. Nobody who I've spoken with actually believes that it's true. The PBMs, the insurance companies are going to go after this. Democrats in Congress are not enthusiastic about it at all. I've heard that people who are in the Biden transition the team are also not enthusiastic about it. The Trump administration is trying to put it into effect starting January 1. So it would be already in effect a fait accompli when the Biden administration takes office. I think it's likely at a minimum that it's going to be delayed. And if it's delayed, it's likely that the Biden administration will scrap it. But again, you never know. And Steve, there was one totally bizarre extra thing, right? Regarding old drugs on pharmacy shelves. Just give us a very quick overview of that. So the FDA from 2001 and in 2006 issued guidance creating what they call the unapproved drugs initiative. The idea is that there are drugs that have been grandfathered in, that have been in use since before modern drug regulations came into effect. FDA wants to get rid of those. It wants to kind of take them out of the shadows. The way that it does that, it creates this incentive. It says, if you're a drug company, if you find an unapproved drug and you do the proper testing in order to get it approved, then FDA will kick all the other versions of it off the market. You'll have a monopoly on that drug for some period of time. The theory is that creates a tremendous incentive for us to get the information about whether these drugs really work or if they don't work and who they work and how they work, and also to have them manufactured at high quality. The downside of it is that a handful of companies have taken advantage of that. They've found unapproved drugs that are really important for a small niche. They've gotten them approved. FDA has kicked the other versions off the market, and then they've jacked the prices up exorbitantly and caused a lot of pain for patients and for the healthcare system. So the Trump administration has basically said, we're going to throw the baby out with the bathwater, just get rid of the whole program and leave it up to the next administration to figure out how they're going to police unapproved drugs going forward. One last thing before we go, it's been another big week for COVID vaccines and therapeutics. On Friday, Pfizer and BioNTech became the first COVID vaccine developers to submit their vaccine for emergency use authorization, and AstraZeneca released some interim data from its phase three vaccine trial earlier today. What are some of the open questions that remain as the frontrunner vaccines move towards authorization? The decision points are going to be first, December 10th, there's going to be an advisory committee meeting for the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Based on everything that we've seen so far, it's quite likely that the advisory committee will recommend an emergency use authorization. The um, FDA is likely to act extremely quickly after that to start distribution. We're going to see emergency use authorization requests from AstraZeneca and from Moderna for their vaccines. I think the Moderna one is likely to also go through quite quickly. The real question about the AstraZeneca one is going to be about how regulators and the advisory committee positions and the public interpret the data from it, which is complicated. I think it's really a little bit too early to see, to determine whether that one's going to fly through or whether there's going to be a requirement for additional clinical data to have more assurance on the efficacy levels around it. The issue there was about the fact that the single dose did better than the double dose, right? Well, no, it wasn't the single dose versus the double dose. It was the prime boost strategy where they had half a dose followed a few weeks later by a full dose, and they compared that to two full doses. The initial reading of the data is that half a dose followed by a full dose was far more effective than two full doses. But I think it's going to take some time to really 
dig through the data and determine whether one, whether that's really a real finding and two, what it means. And then three, is there going to be enough confidence around this data to authorize it based on the studies that have been completed or a regulator is going to say that they need to have more data for more studies. And I think the, maybe the bottom line lesson from it is it's really a good thing that we've got multiple vaccines that are created using multiple modalities so that if there has to be a delay in the AstraZeneca vaccine, it isn't going to be catastrophic. Okay, that's all we have time for today. BioCentury and Bay Helix have just wrapped up the live portion of our seventh China Healthcare Summit. It's the first time we've done it virtually, which means there's still time to register and catch insights on financing, deal making, and regulation in China from KOLs around the globe. All sessions are available until December 11th. You can register at www.biocenturychinasummit.com. All of the podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Music for all of our podcasts is provided by Kendall Square Orchestra, which connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. 